This is Mr. Peterson with the first screencast for Unit 2 in AP Environmental Science. Today, we're going to learn about ecosystems and ecology. Ecosystems are a group of different species that interact with each other and the non-living parts of the environment as well. So let's glide into the information on this screencast. Now on your notes, cells are the basic units of structure and function in life because they're the smallest thing capable of independent life. These are red blood cells two of which have been infected with malaria parasites. We won't spend any time on the parts of a cell because most of our concerns for this class start at the organism level. And although some species are unicellular, most are multicellular. That brings up a big point. If cells make up organisms, at what point can we separate similar looking organisms into different groups? In science, we have a term for that. Organisms can be grouped together as a species if they are capable of breeding together and producing fertile offspring. Just to show you that science is full of gray areas, the picture above is of a mule, which is the offspring of a horse and a donkey. Horses and donkeys are two separate species, but they are similar in many ways. Similar enough that they can even mate and produce offspring. But all mules that are produced are sterile because the two parent species are different enough genetically to prevent fertility. Now, ecology is the study of groups of species and how they interact with each other and the non-living parts of the environment. Once you get past the level of organisms, there are a couple other terms we need to pick up. We put several organisms of the same species together in a defined area that's a population. If we consider populations of different species interacting together in the same area, that's a community. If we add in the community along with the non-living parts of the environment, like the water and soil, it's an ecosystem. And finally, if we put all the ecosystems together on Earth and consider every single part of the Earth that contains life, it's the biosphere. It has four layers that support life. The outermost layer is the atmosphere, and it contains the air we breathe, the ozone that filters out most of the ultraviolet radiation from the sun, and natural greenhouse gases that keep our planet warm enough for life to continue. We'll learn more about the specifics of each layer in later chapters. The next layer is the hydrosphere, and that contains all of the water on Earth, whether it's a lake, river, ocean, underground aquifer, frozen parts of the polar ice caps, or even humidity in the air. After that, we've got the geosphere, which consists of the Earth's crust, along with the mantle and core. The last layer is the biosphere, and if you look right here, it's the small layer that extends from the top of the Earth's crust into the atmosphere. Basically, it goes from the deepest places on Earth that support life all the way to the top of the atmosphere that still supports life. That's a range of about 6 to 10 miles, depending on where you are on Earth. That may seem like a big distance, but if you turned it on its side, you can walk that distance in a day without trying too hard. Different areas of the biosphere are divided into biomes based on the overall climate of an area and the types of vegetation that are found there. We'll learn more about these in a later chapter, but this highly compressed version of an east-west slice of the U.S. shows some of the biomes that we have in the country. There are aquatic biomes as well, but they aren't called biomes. Instead, they're called aquatic life zones. They're usually categorized based on whether they're freshwater or saltwater, and they're also defined based on the level to which sunlight can penetrate to support life. We'll get into those specifics in a later unit. That brings up one of the three factors that sustain life on Earth. The first one is a one-way flow of energy from the sun. The sun gives energy that is responsible for supporting almost all life on Earth. Sure. There's a few deep sea ocean communities that power themselves with hydrogen sulfide that pours out of deep sea ocean vents and don't need sunlight at all. But in the grand scheme of things, the sun is vitally important. Now, it's listed on the outline as a one-way flow of energy. Remember that the first law of thermodynamics says that organisms can change solar energy into chemical energy during photosynthesis, and that can be passed along through the food chain. But the second law of thermodynamics is always there and all that energy will be lost as heat energy. The energy isn't really lost and gone forever, it's just that heat energy isn't very useful for doing additional work, so its usefulness is lost. Second on the list is the cycling of matter. 
The earth isn't growing or shrinking, so there's a fixed supply of materials to work with here. Nutrients that are taken from the environment to be part of living organisms are eventually going to be returned to the environment. And there's a whole army of organisms that help the process to occur. So in a nutshell, the environment is governed by the law of conservation of matter. Third, there's gravity. Astronomers search for planets in the other solar systems that are approximately the size of Earth and that orbit a similar distance from the sun. The Earth exists as a distant from the sun, but water can exist as a liquid, solid, or gas. Too close to the sun, it's all gas. Too far, and it's all ice. I can't make this up. The range where the Earth is found is informally called the Goldilocks zone. So distance from the sun is an important factor, but so is the size of our planet. Planets that are too small don't have enough gravity to hold their atmosphere tightly. So any gases generated simply drift off into space. Now for, the, now for the solar energy that reaches the top of Earth's atmosphere. It consists of all kinds of electromagnetic radiation. That's shown here at the top, with gamma rays all the way to radio waves. The length of the bar shows how far that radiation penetrates through the atmosphere. The types that make it all the way to the Earth's surface are mostly visible light. Long wave ultraviolet radiation and short wave infrared waves or heat. The Earth's magnet magnetosphere shields us from the X-rays and gamma rays, and that's great because life would be pretty hard if that radiation got to the surface. Ozone molecules in the upper atmosphere absorb most of the UV radiation, shielding us from that. That's great because a little bit of UV, radi UV radiation we get is enough to cause skin cancer, cataracts, mutations, and lots of other not-so-great stuff. And that's only from the 5% of UV that doesn't get blocked. A huge portion of the sun's energy is reflected or absorbed by the atmosphere. But enough visible and infrared waves make their way to the surface to support life. Now, of the visible light that makes it to the surface, that's what gives the energy to drive photosynthesis. The heat that makes it to the surface creates winds and helps drive the water cycle. Some of the incoming energy is reflected from the Earth's surface. But something interesting happens when it does. The incoming radiation changes wavelength as it reflects and becomes longer wavelength, seen here. Shorter wavelength radiation, like visible light, can penetrate much further through materials like the air. But longer wavelength radiation, like infrared, is blocked. Infrared energy is longer wavelength than visible light. And that explains why when you park your car on a hot day with the windows up, sunlight can get into your car through the windows. But the inside of the car heats up as the energy changes forms and then is trapped inside your car as heat. Shifting gears here a bit, we've got some more ecological terms to pick up. In an ecosystem, there are living and non-living parts, and they are called biotic, meaning living, and abiotic, meaning non-living, factors. For the longleaf pines here, everything they interact with is one of the two. The minerals in the soil, the water they need, the carbon dioxide in the air, periodic fires, and the temperature are all abiotic factors that affect them. For biotic, they've got to deal with red-headed woodpeckers, drilling holes in them for nests, parasites like fungus and beetles, other trees growing near them and shading them out, and symbi symbiotic fungi that grow on their roots and help them absorb nutrients from the soil. Those factors add up to make something called a range of tolerance, and it's exactly what it sounds like. Each species on Earth can exist in a range where as long as enough things are right about a place, they can survive. But some places are going to be much better than others. In this picture, the fish are tightly grouped together in the middle, and that's because the temperature of the water is optimal. Outside of that ideal range, fish can survive, but they're stressed. That might make them less healthy, or it might result in shorter lifespans, or they might have fewer offspring than less stressed organisms. On the subject of one organism consuming another, that brings us to trophic levels. Trough means to feed or eat. And each species has a spot or trophic level that it hangs out at in the ecosystem. The first trophic level is made up of producers, which are organisms that can capture solar energy by photosynthesis. They're also called autotrophs, which means self-feeding. Any organism that ultimately depend on autotrophs are called heterotrophs, 
or consumers, because they consume the energy that was originally captured by the producers. Consumers that consume plant material are called primary consumers or herbivores. The primary consumer part refers to the trophic level they're on, and the herbivore part refers to the fact that they are eating plant material. One level up from that are the secondary consumers that eat the primary consumers. They're called carnivores because they feed on animal flesh. They're also called predators, but that can include organisms from the next level up too. So if this mountain lion attacked and killed the bison from the previous picture, it would be a secondary consumer. Third level consumers eat secondary and primary consumers. Like those wolves could conceivably attack and kill a mountain lion, it would have to be an old mountain lion having a pretty bad day, but the way wolves work together can give them the upper hand against larger animals. It's probably a stretch, but the point is that the tertiary consumers kill and eat primary and secondary consumers. Now, in reality, many consumer organisms exist at multiple trophic levels. This bear is currently in a carnivore role, catching fish swimming upstream to breed. But the bear spends a great portion of the year eating berries and other plant material. That combination of feeding style makes him an omnivore. We've also got decomposers and detritivores. Both of these eat matter that's already dead. And the major difference is that detritivores break down big chunks of materials into smaller ones, like all of these insects breaking down a log into smaller pieces. But decomposers actually break down these small bits into even smaller bits that restore the nutrients and that material back to the soil. To put it another way, to try to more support decomposers and make their job easier by breaking dead organic matter into smaller pieces. But decomposers could eventually do the job without the tritivores. It would just take longer. Now the tritivores aren't just insects. Plenty of larger organisms like catfish and vultures would fit into this group as well. The important thing here is to remember that nutrients that are important for life make up a cycle of use and return to the soil. Well, the energy that ultimately came from the sun is released as heat into the environment and can't be reclaimed for further use. You can think of the sun's energy in this picture as providing the energy to spin the wheel. But the only thing that comes back around to start again at the producer level is matter, because the energy is all dispersed along the way. The first law of thermodynamics says that these arrows are okay when energy is changed from one form to another, but that these ones that spin off as heat every time are due to the second law of thermodynamics. Look at an organized diagram of the feeding relationships between organisms like this one. It's called a food chain. It shows how the energy moves from the sun through a series of organisms, eventually being lost as heat, and then it includes the decomposers and detritivores that return nutrients back to the soil for reuse. In reality, things are rarely this simple, where each organism is shown consuming only one kind of organism. It's usually much more complex, like this bigger diagram called a food web. Food webs show a more realistic picture because most organisms eat multiple kinds of food and are in turn preyed upon by multiple species as well. The trophic levels are still there, but it's more, just more complex. Now, each level of a food chain or food web contains a certain amount of organisms, and if you dried them out to make things equal and then weighed them, the total weight of that dry material would be called biomass. Biomass is what contains the energy of an organism, because the water weight of all organisms doesn't carry any energy. So when one organism eats another, it gains that organism's chemical energy by eating the biomass. The transfer of energy from one trophic level to the next isn't very efficient. It's measured by ecological efficiency, and it's a percentage of usable chemical energy that is transferred from one trophic level to the next. It ranges from 2 to 40%, which means that when one organism eats another, somewhere between 90 and 60% of the energy is wasted. The general rule is that there is an average 90% loss between trophic levels, so only 10% of the energy in one trophic level ever moves up to the next one. Why? Well, if you look at the bottom level of this pyramid with the phytoplankton producers, imagine all the solar energy that they captured by photosynthesis. Now, before they got eaten by the primary consumers, the zooplankton, what did those phytoplankton have to do? Well, they had to grow, that used energy. They had to move around, and that used energy. Both of these conversions of energy resulted in some heat loss. So there goes some of that original energy. 
that probably shed parts of their body and those were gobbled up by decomposers. Energy is being used here, but it's not ever going to find its way up to the primary consumers. This pyramid can show you why there are so many producers in an ecosystem. But at the top, there's only a few tertiary or third level consumers. If you start with a dollar's worth of energy at the bottom, at the primary consumer level, you're only going to have a dime's worth secondary consumer level reduces to a penny. And then by the time you reach the tertiary consumers, you're down to a tenth of a cent. Energy transfer into ecosystems isn't really efficient. So energy has a one-way flow through the ecosystem, but matter is continually cycling through and being used and reused. In very real terms, think of someone famous from history. Chances are you'll breathe some of the same air molecules as that person during your life. And some of the water molecules that are in you right now could also have been their bodies as well. It's the same matter, it just gets recycled. Each major type of matter flows through the ecosystem in a biogeochemical cycle, which means that it's part of its life for a while and part of rocks, chemicals, or the air for a while. It's easier to call most of those them nutrient cycles. The first one is the hydrologic cycle, also known as the water cycle. You're probably most familiar with this one. Now, there's a lot to cover on each of these cycles, and just to reinforce the point that you need to be reading the book, I'm not gonna include these cycles in the screencast. If you're looking at the notes outline, there's a note there to guide you as you read the book. For each cycle, focus on each material flows, where it is originally found, and where it does it go. Are there any special terms for changes in that cycle? Next up, why is that particular material important for life? What does it make? What does it do? Why do we need it? Last up, focus on how we as humans alter the natural cycle of that material. We'll discuss each of these cycles in class, but I may be leaving this part for you to read in the book. You need to read the whole chapter and take notes. A depiction of the carbon cycle. Here's a depiction of the nitrogen cycle. Phosphorus cycle. And that's it for now. Thanks for watching.